map that I was telling you about. Um, yeah, and if that ever happens, if anything of a technical nature like that ever happens, do speak up right away so that I don't go on for pages without <laughs> without you being able to see what I'm showing you. But anyway, this is the map that I was talking about that has all of the um, tribal affiliations listed on it. And this is what I was just talking about, Cahokia, the Mississippian Indian city. And what you will notice about this picture is that some of the buildings are located on top of giant mounds and that there is a wall surrounding the city for defense. And this was really comparable to many of the uh, biggest cities in Europe at the same time that we're talking about, like around 1100 or 1200 of the common era. Okay. All right. Well, the first thing that happens in the history of indigenous America is that the uh, continents of North and South America are populated. And there are a couple of different things that I'm going to have to say about this. First of all, that uh, it is thought that nomadic Siberians crossed the Bering Straits, a sort of ice bridge in between uh, Asia and Alaska, sometime between 25,000 and 11,000 years ago, and then migrated throughout North America and South America all the way down to the southern tip of South America. The traditional interpretation of the crossing, um, the sort of Bering Land Bridge crossing, dates from the 1500s. That is when the first sort of anthropologists or proto-anthropologists started thinking about, okay, well, how long have people been here? And the archaeological evidence supported the interpretation that the first um, indigenous Americans were Ice Age hunters. But over the past two decades or so, this interpretation has become more controversial, with some archaeologists saying that, oh, the only reason we think people were big game Ice Age hunters is because of the kinds of things that have a tendency to survive, the kinds of archaeological evidence that survive. <coughs> they think that, in fact, only on the Central Plains were people doing a lot of big game hunting. And over the rest of the country, the indigenous Americans probably supplemented their hunting with um, trapping small game, gathering uh, berries and fruits and vegetables, and possibly fishing and hunting turtles. They're now actively looking for the kinds of evidence of hunting and gathering and fishing that you might find, but things like baskets and nets have a much shorter sort of shelf life, archeologically ar speaking, than do, let's say, the bones of large game animals. Now, another um, thing that has come to supplement the story of how it is that indigenous Americans got to the Americas is the discovery of the Monte Verde campsite in Chile, which seems to show that um, somewhere around 14,000 years ago, indigenous Americans traveled by boat. Um, they're dredging now underwater sites because they found some uh, evidence of really, really old boats and canoes. Uh, there are other examples of people doing really long distance travel across the Pacific, um, indigenous groups uh, in search of new settlement. So boat travel also seems to have also um, backed up the crossing the Bering Straits theory. And then the third thing I want to tell you is that every indigenous tribe also has its own explanation of how people came to be where they are. And this is just the very beginning of a kind of set of um, contrasts between indigenous worldviews and European worldviews. So I want to show you a quick 
um, video of an indigenous story of emergence so that you can see what I'm talking about. All right, so I'm gonna share a different thing now. Wait. Okay. Professor, I don't think there's sound in the... Yeah, we can't us. hear it. Huh. Let's see. Yeah, for some reason when you play a video, uh, the sound doesn't travel to us. It's just only for you. For some oh, reason. that is really weird. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I will deal with that issue for the next class in that case. But what I'm going to say is I will link this um, Lakota creation story to week two of the syllabus. It's only three minutes long, so you can watch it, you know, between this class and the next class. Thanks for letting me know. That's good to know. All right. Okay. Can you guys see the PowerPoint now? Uh, we're looking no, at we YouTube. just see the YouTube. Okay. Let me. A student just said in chat that you can make the sound work some some of her other professors have done it but she isn't sure how to do it exactly yeah it's fine i'll figure it out uh, let's see what yeah i'll i'll uh, ask after the class okay so stop share share screen here we go okay now can you see the powerpoint yes yeah awesome Okay, um, the two major cultural differences that archaeologists identify among the early indigenous Americans are hunting and gathering groups and the technology that they found that um, supports hunting and gathering uh, is from about 13,000 years ago, spear points and um, arrowheads that used to be used for gathering and hunting game. Um, some of the first ones were found in Clovis, actually, in the area around Clovis. And there's a museum on the campus of ENMU um, that showcases some of these finds. And then significantly, the development of agriculture um, created all kinds of different opportunities for Native American culture. Now, let me ask you this. If you are hunting and gathering for your survival, what does that mean in terms of, let's say, the size of your group that can successfully hunt and gather? Small Big group. Yeah, it has to be. It has to be small because you need a lot of calories to be able to um, survive. And so you have to have like maybe an extended family group that's probably about the biggest you could have. What is possible when you have agriculture? Like what kind of a, a size of group could you have? You can have a much bigger like society. Kind of. mm -hmm. Yeah. So what else is it about? Um, what is another difference between hunting and gathering versus agriculture? Uh, nomadic versus settling down. Excellent. Excellent. Good answer. Yes. So you have to have a more portable society if you are working with hunting and gathering. Um, whereas with agriculture, you can settle down, you can build cities, you can have 
larger organizations of society. You can have um, more complex societies. And so this is something that accounts for some of the cultural differences that we will see. Oops. Okay, did I just skip one? All right, there was great diversity uh, at the advent of European contact with Native America due to this splitting off of agricultural and non-agricultural groups. And one of the groups I wanna talk about first are the uh, cliff-dwelling um, ancient Pueblo people of the Southwest. Early Pueblo peoples included groups like the Mogollon and Hohokam peoples of places like New Mexico, especially Southern New Mexico, and also what is today Arizona. They had settled in the Southwest at least 4,000 years prior to the advent of the Spanish in the 1540s. At first, the Indigenous people lived in pit houses that were sort of like um, dugouts dug into cliffs and covered over with um, foliage. And then between 700 and 900 AD, they began to construct much larger um, sort of apartment houses and communities. By 1200 AD, the Pueblo peoples of the Southwest had developed a lot of uh, large, many-roomed buildings, some of which are just as big as anything that had existed in Europe at the exact same time. For example, if you look in the uh, northwest corner of New Mexico, um, the largest buildings at Pueblo Bonito contained about 650 rooms. And if they were actual living quarters, could have housed as many as 1,000 people. You wouldn't find the same size or the same density of um, human habitation until like the 19th century in urban areas. Now I say if people actually live there, because when I went to Chaco Canyon and toured around, what they said was these were probably not living spaces because they lacked hearths where you'd wanna cook your food. And instead they were thought to be some kind of ceremonial structures for religious practices. It's been a while since I was there and I need to check and see whether that's the latest knowledge, but that's what I was told when I was there. Okay. All right, in terms of the social structure of these ancient Pueblo peoples, uh, they did practice agriculture they were able to grow foods like corn, beans, and squash, which are often called the three sisters, and also things like pumpkins, sunflower, and cotton. Irrigation was practiced on a very small scale. Sheep herding was a major subsistence activity. And hunting was primarily a ceremonial activity. Pueblos were erected that consisted of terraced apartment buildings built of adobe, two or more stories tall, arranged around streets and plazas. Residence was natural local, so that means that people, when they um, created their families, went to go live with their mother's family or often their mother's brother. Extended families lived together, and each Pueblo had a number of underground structures known as kivas where religious activities were conducted. Each Pueblo was politically independent. There was no overall chief or council, although there was often a village chief whose office was hereditary. There were clans too that were in charge of um, resources like water, fields, shrines, ritual equipment, kivas. And then finally, in terms of the religion that was practiced, um, we don't, 
we don't necessarily know everything about the religion that was practiced, but we can sort of back form or back assume from um, current day Pueblo religious practices or Hopi religious practices um, to say that there was elaborate ceremonialism. Um, there were spiritual beings that uh, called kachinas that represented the spirits of plants, animals, stars, ancestors who aided men and women in their journeys through life, and that these kachinas played an important role in religious ceremonies that included dances and chants. I mean, a lot of what happens in the religion of the um, Pueblo people was private, and so people were not necessarily um, writing all this down for people outside of the Pueblo community to learn about. Okay, questions? Sorry, what were the kivas again? Like, were they for they're, meetings? Yeah, they're for meetings, they're for <clears throat> religious meetings, they're probably also for political meetings. The kivas are located underground. They're usually circular, but sometimes there's a few square ones. Um, generally speaking, they have a couple of factors in common. So there will be a hole called a sipapu, which is sort of in the uh, many of the Pueblo emergence stories. This is the hole through which people uh, emerged into the world that we're in right now, which is usually the fourth world. There are three previous worlds. Um, there tend to be benches around the outside. There's a ladder to go up and down. There's a fire pit. Um, so these kivas are found uh, at every ancient Pueblo site that I've ever been to. Uh, and there are some today that still exist in Pueblos that are currently um, lived in. Yes, you can think of them like modern day churches. I like that. Yes, so like for example, at, at Taos Pueblo and stuff. Yes, Professor, if I could add in just one second. Please do. Last summer, I took an archaeology class. I was at the branch of ENMU in Ridoso, and we took an archaeology class, and we were digging in a kiva near La Luz, and it was the most amazing experience I've ever had with a class. We were out in the New Mexico desert in the sun for hours all day, but we found some turquoise necklaces and pottery from thousands of years ago, and it was just amazing. Well, that is fantastic, and that brings up a couple things that are not actually in my lecture notes, but that I should also mention to you. There was trade with pretty far-flung areas um, going on between the, the Pueblo Indians and uh, the indigenous people of Central Mexico and even South America. So there are feathers and um, precious stones and things that made it really far, showing the extent to which this was a sort of integrated set of cultures. Thanks, that was a, a really good point, Summary. You're welcome, thank you for letting me interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like it when people interrupt with interesting stuff, that's really cool. All right, other questions, comments? Yeah, I have a question about the Kivas. Were they sure. strictly related to the Pueblo, Pueblo Indians or did other tribes also have them? Um, I am only familiar with them in the context of the uh, indigenous Pueblo peoples of the Southwest. So in the other readings that we have for this class, you know, where it talks about the diversity of Native Americans, they don't, none of those readings mention kivas. Um, I know that, um, for example, California Indians didn't have them, the indigenous peoples of the Northeast didn't have them. So that's about all I can tell you. Good question. Other questions? All right, so the next group we're gonna be looking at, oops, as I press the wrong button, are the indigenous um, Americans of what is sort of like the, the nation's midsection. The Mississippian, uh, Native Americans lived in the area that was bounded by Wisconsin to the north, Louisiana to the south, Oklahoma to the west, and Tennessee to the east. And 
today, Cahokia National Historic Site is a national park that you can visit that's in Illinois. So, you know, the Mound Builder Culture, as it's also called, um, covered a vast area, but some of the, um, some of the most impressive ruins or um, what's left of the mounds that they erected are located in Illinois. Okay, the Mississippi, in, Mississippi Indians were agricultural, sedentary Native Americans with corn, squash, and several seed bearing plants as their principal crops. And so they were able to have a really stable so social base. They stayed where they were for a really long time. And we were able to you know, learn more about them through what they left behind, which are two main things, the palisade around their central city of Cahokia, and then the mounds that they erected for um, buildings to be on top of. At the peak of settlement from 1100 to 1200 AD, um, the city of Cahokia covered nearly six square miles and had a population as great as 20,000 people in extensive residential sections. And then in the central part of the city, there were these enormous mounds that were used for ritual purposes or buildings were built on top of them or they were used for burial. Originally, there were more than 120 mounds that were built by the Mississippian Indians, but the locations of only 109 have been recorded. Many were altered by modern farming or destroyed by urban construction. But what we do know is that the Mississippian culture people moved more than 50 million cubic feet of earth just for mound construction alone, and they did this all by hand. There were three different types of mounds. The most common was a platform whose flat top served as a base for ceremonial buildings or residences of the elite. And there were also conical mounds and ridgetop mounds used for burials of important people. One mound had evidence of 300 ceremonial and sacrificial bur burials, mostly of young women between 15 and 25 years old in mass graves. The largest mound, Monk's Mound, uh, is the largest prehistoric, I hate that word prehistoric, the largest indigenous um, earth and construction in the new world. It covers more than 14 acres, it's 100 feet tall, and there was a huge building on top that was 105 feet long, 48 feet wide, about 50 feet high, and we think this is where the, the main chief of uh, the Mississippian people lived. The center of the city was surrounded by a two mile long stockade, a wall of posts set in trenches with guard towers every 70 feet. The stockade was constructed four different times because you know it was made out of wood so it had a tendency to fall down. Each construction took nearly 20,000 logs. It was built for defense but also as a social barrier because only the really important people lived within the barrier and the farm fields and the sort of peasantry lived on the outside. Finally, there were four calendars, sun calendars, that once consisted of evenly spaced log posts. I'm sure you guys have heard of Stonehenge, the sort of um, pre-Christian stone calendar circle that exists in southern England. Um, archaeologists call the Mississippian analog Woodhenge because it was made out of wood and they um, determine the changing seasons and certain ceremonial periods. Okay, questions about this page.
How do we know there were over 120 mounds when we only found 109? Well, that's a good question, but my assumption is that we know on the basis of earlier documentation by the first people who passed through, you know, we're told that there were 120. And then when it actually came time to lay out the boundaries of the national park, 109 is how many they found. So that's normally how it works. Um, there's a great show on British television called Time Team, where they dig uh, into the ground in various places in England and Wales and Scotland and find Roman ruins and things that have been left. And often they're working with, okay, well, in the 18th century, somebody made a map and said that there was something here. So now we're going to dig. And oops, tractors ripped it up. And so it's not there anymore. We have no evidence. Um, so I assume it's something like that. Good question. Other questions? A variety of smaller tribes lived in villages on the East Coast. We might call them East Coast woodland dwellers, the Delaware or the um, Lenny Lenape, as they're also called, are a good example. Some of the largest villages on the East Coast were about the same size as many European towns in the same period. They might have as many as four to 6,000 people, but most of them were substantially smaller. Um, the East Coast woodland dwellers tended to move back and forth with the season. So during the summer, they would move out to the seashore and fish and get seafood. And then during the winter, they would hole up in longhouses in the interior and live on the um, live on the remains of what they had hunted during the seasons where hunting was possible. Generally speaking, there was also for the indigenous Americans a kind of starving time in the winter where people just ate less. This was something that was commented upon by some of the Europeans who uh, made early contact with the Native Americans. The East Coast uh, Native American groups were ruled by chiefs or sachems, some of whom were women. And because there were so many tribal groups and they were sort of, you know, each among, each to themselves, um, they tended to be easy prey for the um, the viruses and bacteria that came with the Europeans or even before the Europeans. So a lot of the Native Americans of the um, East Coast area, especially like Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut got wiped out before there was much Native American, before there was much European contact. All that remains is the names that they gave to towns. So names like Natick, Saugus, Neponset, Agawam, you know, these were all originally tribes. But one exception to the general rule of people living in small groups was the Iroquois. And the Iroquois were this large confederation in the Northeast, combined five tribes, the Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, Mohawk, and Oneida. And the Iroquois, their influence covered the entire um, northeast area, what is now the Northeast United States, from Virginia all the way up to um, southern Canada. The Iroquois were very militarily strong and politically cohesive. And the story about their confederation goes like this, that they had a chief, Chief Daganawita, who had a vision that there was a lot of um, there was a lot of infighting among the five tribes that made up the um, confederation that would become the Iroquois Confederation, and there was a lot of revenge killing. And he had a vision that if instead they collectively went through a mourning ritual every time somebody died, instead of um, seeking revenge killings, that they would prosper. And so, based on this vision. 
they formed into the Iroquois League and set up a series of 50 chiefs um, taken from the five tribes who would make decisions for the collectivity. In times of war where the Iroquois were fighting against an outside group, these 50 peace chiefs would be replaced with war chiefs. And kind of like the Romans, they spread throughout this huge area without necessarily having full control over the people that they um, lived alongside. They absorbed other smaller tribes and groups, but in a very sort of patron client kind of a way. So people were controlled by the Iroquois without necessarily being part of the Iroquois Confederation. There were about 20,000 Iroquois in the five tribes that made up their confederation in 1600, but this was, you know, small compared to the total number of Native Americans in the Northeast. The name Iroquois was given to them by their enemies, the Algonquin, it means rattlesnakes. The Iroquois themselves called themselves Haudenosaunee, which means people of the longhouse. The Haudenosaunee, which I guess I should change the slide to reflect their name, um, were known for their distinctive longhouses, which were like 200, um, 200 feet long. And what you do to build a longhouse is to cultivate some trees and then to join or lash those trees together at the tops and then cover the outside of that structure with woven mats. And these longhouses had um, hearths inside. They were very insulated inside with furs. And villages were moved only about every 20 years so people could build for uh, permanence. Uh, let's see. In terms of gender roles, women had a very important role in the Iroquois Confederation. Husbands came to live with their wives' families. Divorce was the woman's prerogative rather than the man's. Women had the political power to appoint chiefs and sachems, and they were left entirely in charge when the men went on hunting trips. Um, the society was organized into clans, three clans called Turtle, Bear, and Wolf, and uh, women were in charge of the clans, and the clans were in charge of agriculture. And again, corn, beans, and squash were the major um, crops that were grown. Women owned and tended the fields under the supervision of the clan mother. Child rearing techniques among the Iroquois were much more permissive than among the Europeans who come to document what they see um, in America among the indigenous people. For example, um, there was late weaning. Uh, children were breastfed until quite late. There were very relaxed attitudes about clothing, about toilet training, about, I don't know, even following directions. The point was to build an autonomous individual who was enticed to participate in the group through appreciation of the group, through wanting to belong, through um, wanting to follow the group's rules through pride and a sense of tradition rather than being coerced. We're going to see how different this is to European styles of raising children in lecture two when we talk about some of the exchanges of people, personnel that took place between indigenous groups and the Europeans. There was less hierarchy. There was more democracy than in many European cultures at the same time. And ostracism and shaming were more effective punishments in a system where social cohesiveness was so important than in Europe where, you know, there was physical punishment, there were uh, jails, there were uh, public um, whippings and, and such. Finally, the Iroquois and other indigenous groups on the East Coast believed that 
visions and dreams were very important that you got instructions through your dreams and that the way you preserved your health was by satisfying the wishes of your soul that were expressed in dreams so if you dreamed about giving a party or you dreamed about making a certain shirt or you dreamed about making a certain weapon it was very important that you do that that there was kind of a uh, a gauze through which um, the spiritual world penetrated into the physical world okay questions All right. Let me just move this a sec. Okay, so I have a question. Yes. Would we be tested a lot on on this chapter? You can say like before uh, life before the exploration of the Europeans. Um. All right. Here is how I have done testing in the past. How I've done testing in the past is. Half the test is ID questions where you have to identify and explain the historical significance of something. And half the test is an essay where you like look at a primary source and have to in interact with that primary source, kind of talk about who you think created the primary source, the audience, the context, that sort of thing. But I don't think that will work well for a hybrid testing situation. So what I'm planning to do is to give you a couple of choices of what I might call document-based questions, where I get some documents that you haven't seen before, let's say five short documents, and you have to look at them and write an essay in response to a prompt. So you could have a question about Native America before the Europeans, or you could have a question on the midterm about um, the advent of the American Revolution. You know, so what I'm going to say is be prepared to know not necessarily every detail about everything, but the main ideas that will help you to put documents into historical context. If you for example, look at this week's primary source, you will see that it is a, um, it goes along with the story of Native Americans, that it talks about the origin story of one of the Native American groups. And those are the kinds of things you need to get used to reading and think about, oh, okay, this goes with the story of Native Americans and European contact or whatever. And I know a little bit more about this that I can put into an essay about it. And I can use these documents to answer a question about it. Does that make sense? Yeah, so okay, that makes a lot more sense because I was thinking like the test will be like, um, what were the tribes back then during the 14, 1500? I thought it would be something like that. No. But no, that answers. Thank you so much. No, um, I give you, I tell you these stories about how it was back then, not just, not so, not even primarily so that you can spit back to me names, dates, people, places, and things, but rather so that you have examples that you can latch on to, remember, okay, the main idea of today's lecture being Native America was very diverse, there were hunter-gatherers, there were agricultural people, um, even in the sense of agricultural civilizations, there was a fair amount of diversity. You had something that was almost like the Roman Empire in the Iroquois Confederation, you know, so listen carefully, take notes, you can go back and review, but also I would say don't sweat the small stuff, especially this semester where we're having to do a little different testing than I normally do. Okay. Yeah. Other if questions? I, yeah. If I can just comment on that, um, Dr. Bronstein has been putting up with me for a while now. Um, <laughs> I can confidently say that all of these little details are not exactly the important part. You just need to have the critical thinking to know what that means about the tribe. So just like listen to the story, take notes on the very, on the, on the, um, on the big characteristics. I, I take notes on everything, but you know, 
take take notes on the big characteristics, you will do fine. They are not difficult quizzes as long as you are paying attention. I assure you. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank um, you so much. On the on the note taking. I think I forgot to say this the first day of class, but it's always good if you review your notes every week. So take the notes that you take and then each week, maybe the same day each week, Sunday, I don't know, take half an hour and read back through your notes because the more you read your notes, the more they stick with you. That was the study a method that I used when I was an undergraduate and I found that it really helped. I never had to sit and cram the night before or any of that because I really knew what I had written down. So, all right, last slide here. We're coming up to um, the Colombian exchange, to European contact, and what I want to emphasize here is that there were some key differences in the Native American worldview in general versus the European worldview. There were different roles for religion. There is more of a sense of the interpenetration between the spiritual and the physical among Native Americans at the time of contact. Um, what religion at the moment of contact uh, is the religion of the Europeans? Christianity. Yeah. And what Christianity in particular? Catholicism. Yes. Okay. So they are Catholic. They have a very hierarchical religious structure with um, certain rules. This is not to say that people didn't have certain beliefs that Native Americans would have really recognized because there was a lot of belief in, um, let's say, otherworldly, otherworldly beings, angels, demons, witchcraft. Um, these are all things that come up in European belief systems. Uh, Black, black magic, white magic, um, amulets to achieve certain things, but the official religion is Catholicism. And in contrast, among Native Americans, you might have um, people who are going to go hunting, and at first they say a little prayer of thanksgiving to the animal that they're going to be hunting, or they um, imbue uh, the kachinas with certain characteristics that belong to, let's say, the sun or corn or the rain. A second key difference is common use versus the commodification of nature. And what I mean there is, with few exceptions, Native Americans believed that the land was theirs to use, but ownership was not a thing, that the, the earth had been created by the creator for, um, for people to live using that earth. But the idea that somebody could buy it, somebody could sell it, somebody should fence it off and nobody else could use it, that was pretty controversial. In contrast, Europeans believe in land titles. They believe that you can come and plant the flag of Spain and claim a place that you've never been before for the, for the king and queen that you can sell plots of land that you've never seen. And so this is going to lead to a lot of um, misunderstandings is putting it mildly, I would say, land theft and violence. And then finally, there is much more social mobility with few, few exceptions in indigenous America than in Europe at the same time. We're still dealing with feudalism in the European system. There are still serfs who are um, who are kind of tied to the land. There are roles, as we're going to see in the next lecture, um, that are very closely prescribed of how people behave and what everybody does, what the, the knights do, what their vassals do, what the king does, what the church does. So in indigenous America, there's more social mobility based on what it is that you are able to accomplish your own self. Um, the kinds of qualities that you have. Okay, any questions? Someone in chat said, um, higher power question mark. Yes, um, there is a belief in a higher power in many of the um, 
Native American belief systems has a different name from what the Catholics would have referred to, but seems kind of similar in terms of um, participating in creation. But often the creation stories um, also involve like animals or other kinds of beings. So there'd be like multiple gods that participated in creation or participated in the creation of humans. So it tends to be a little bit more complicated, but I would say, yeah, most of them have some kind of a higher power. Other questions? Okay. That is where I'm going to stop it for today then. I will see you guys uh, sometime.